Despite theory being diametrically opposed to the sensibilities of director Anzi Zawowski, I cannot help but come back to his 1981 cult film Possession to pursue textual analysis. Whether intended or derived, the film has just about everything. Horror, comedy, science fiction, romance, religious and political commentary, and so on and so forth. What can easily be thought of as marital drama with a supernatural slant is quite the sophisticated text. In 2018, I launched my channel by positing that protagonist Mark is gay, or at the very least has homosexual tendencies. This was never meant to be a definitive statement, but rather one of many interpretations that can be extrapolated from the film. Proper hindsight reveals my previous interpretation can be expanded upon. While this analysis will reassess Mark's sexual orientation, that is merely a jumping off point for a larger idea I wish to communicate. That being, how possession treats the construction of social identities, and in turn, what it says about them. This is Style of Substance. Welcome to my ongoing analysis of possession. For a multitude of reasons, I have previously read protagonist Mark as gay. To reiterate, the way in which he touches his son Bob is the same as the way he touches his wife Anna, thus confirming that he more or less views the two equally, that is, as members of the traditional family structure that he desperately tries preserving, without any clear sexual attraction. Despite this, Mark feels he must fulfill traditional patriarchal duties by engaging in sexual intercourse with maternal figures Anna and her doppelganger Helen. But he becomes relieved once Helen assures that he doesn't need to, suggesting that he may lack the heterosexuality that is expected of him. You don't have to make love to me. I'm not trying. Mark likely fails to have intercourse with Anna, and becomes mesmerized by the prospect of his wife with another man. The scenes featuring Heinrich are filled to the brim with overt homoerotic implications. Mark may want to kill him, but he also wants to be with him. Okay, I like you. Mark's new idealistic self manifests in the xenomorphic creature of divine origin. As a transformation takes place, the overtly gay detective and his lover are killed. As is Heinrich, thereby wiping out the non-heteronormative influences in Mark's life. Following a spiritual awakening and gay conversion, Mark successfully sleeps with his wife, but eventually finds himself at odds with what has become of him. His identity is stripped away from him in favor of a devilish lie, just as Anna's identity had been stripped away from her in their marriage for some time, that is, until her emancipation and subsequent replacement by her idealized form Helen. The artifice of normalcy is to be distrusted, which is why Bob senses wrong in the end, just moments before apocalyptic disaster. The familiar traditions we value and preserve can only go so far. If Mark is indeed gay, he sacrifices his own identity to preserve this possessive structure, one that oppresses him and his wife. Mark and Anna are deprived of their identities, the things that make them unique, and are thereby rendered as mere possessions, belonging to greater forces at play. The central couple's marriage is a mirror to the Berlin Wall, a national landmark and geographical barrier possessing considerable symbolic weight. The social effects of the wall were quite devastating, tension perpetuated between both sides by penetrating the hearts and souls of those living behind the oppressive structure. We remember the woman being held by communist guards to prevent her from joining her family. They even threw tear gas at those who were below ready to catch her. The West thrived while the East saw slow development under communist rule. The East craved the access to the material goods and quality of life that the West possessed. We cannot be together. The Berlin Wall is spotted in possession at various points, and many hints of the socio-political tension are expressed throughout the film. This is not just a simple motif to visually reinforce the separation between the two leads and the oppression of the structures in place, but rather it is crucial to understanding the narrative itself. The intimate relationship reinforces the political backdrop, and vice versa. From an autobiographical point of view, Possession mirrors Zawowski's own experiences, both with his ex-wife and also with his departure from Poland. 
Berlin was made the setting of possession because of its relationship with Poland and other European countries. The setting here is key. Consider the different homes depicted in the film. First, there is a fairly modern apartment Helen and Mark live in, and then the beaten down and likely abandoned old house where the creature is hidden. Both are located next to the Berlin Wall, on opposite sides, and this juxtaposition showcases the stark differences between living conditions. We can also gain something from the color coding in these scenes. Green, and especially green eyes, are often associated with envy. Mark's eyes are blue, as are the blankets in his apartment, but the blanket and eyes of the creature, as well as Helen, are a stark green, implying an underlying level of envy here in contrast. The doppelgangers may take what is not theirs, including social roles previously belonging to others, but they also fight their way to get in, even if they seem to pose a threat. This makes some sense given the fears and relations between the East and the West at the time. Now, the politics of this film are often muddled and paradoxical, mind you. Analysis can only go so far, as possession is designed to be understood more on an intuitive level, which means with just about every explanation may come a contradiction. With every interpretation comes a rebuttal, and so long as it can be supported by the text itself, just about any reading is valid. Mark is, or at least was, an intelligence agent, or a spy of sorts. However, his true political affiliation is left ambiguous. Towards the beginning of the film, he has paid a suitcase of money for a secret mission he took. One of his employers wears vibrant pink socks, an indication of the exotified and wealthy Western culture. Does our subject still wear pink socks? But Mark wishes to reject politics altogether, only for politics to come back into his life by the end. Because everything one does, whether consciously or unconsciously, can be seen as political. Even leaving his job for his family is in itself a political act. But this choice also coincided with Anna's decision to separate from him, followed by a pact made with the devil, or whatever the creature represents. Basically, it is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, as the very preservation of the family structure was in part what led Anna astray, but so too was Mark's distance from the family. Fittingly, the two end up in the same place together, bleeding to death on the spiral staircase, and replaced by the other. The ending features sirens, explosion rumbles, and toy army men, alluding to an armed conflict that had divided Berlin into two, which in turn could also hint at some sort of potential nuclear warfare in the imminent future. From this, we can see that while the film is intimate, it is also quite broad with its messages that it communicates. Just as Mark and Anna's marriage deteriorates before our eyes, so too does Berlin. And even if the wall is demolished, as it was some years later, things don't simply go back to normal just like that, even with a semblance of happiness and peace for a brief moment. As long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open, but the question of freedom for all mankind. Mark's efforts to leave work in favor of returning to an equally political structure may still be noble. That is, at least when it comes to raising Bob. Whether he is a good parent at the core is definitely up for debate. But it should be quite obvious that he does love Bob, and wants to take care of him the best that he can. In Anna's absence, he invites Margie, and then later Helen, to replace her. Though for as good a familiar figure as Helen may be, embodying that role would ultimately turn her to an idealized possession, an asset for the family unit. In some respects, Mark's conservative longing to uphold this patriarchal structure is indicative of toxic masculinity. Whether that is specific to him as a person, or simply representative of the ideas of sex-specific roles ascribed to the society he lives in, his efforts to persuade Anna are simply compromises to maintain the nuclear family, and are not at first sincere attempts at reaching mutual understanding. To him, she is a possession of sorts, a cog in this clock. But it is a clock on a time bomb, ticking down the minutes until destruction. <coughs> Mark's insecurity, misogyny, and projection get in the way of viewing Anna as anything more than a possession, which is partially what threw a wrench in their relationship in the first place. Incompatibility on a sexual level may, or may not, 
simply be a symptom of this hyper-possessive role, rather than a mere indication of homosexuality, as I have previously postulated. It is not until watching Heinrich's videotape that Mark begins to see things from Anna's point of view, and acts according to her will. Once he follows her lead, trading the supposed patriarchy for short-lived matriarchy, Mark loses his sense of identity, just as she had lost hers when following his lead. Anna was once seen with blood pouring from her mouth at the hands of her husband, but by the end, something similar happens to Mark. The two are destined to hurt each other, and the relationship is destined to fail. But that's largely because there are outside forces influencing and harming the two, and taking control of every aspect of their private lives. Traditionally, the female identity is one that is not only complementary, but also subservient to its male counterpart. Just as all individuals are made possessions by the state, wives are made possessions by their husbands. This is true for Anna and how she is treated by Mark. Even when admitting he has fallen out of love and sexual attraction, Mark wishes to restore the traditional order, with him as possessor and Anna as possession. What is first seen as irrational hysteria in Anna is revealed to be a desperate attempt to escape the order that treats her as an object. Because the veil of idealism is lifted, she appears uglier to Mark when he finally tries to understand her plight. You look uglier. You've hardened. For the first time, you look vulgar to me. Yet, it is through the absence of Mark that Anna was led to question her own insanity and pursue sexual affairs. Emotionally and psychologically, Anna reaches her crossroads and must choose to either maintain the conservative nuclear family as a traditional housewife and mother, or to find happiness in a sense of spiritual awakening by being independent. I guess when you're there, you want to be home, and when you're home, you want to be there. However, her agency is initially challenged by her husband at every other turn. When she says she needs time to think about herself, he questions this. I need some time to think. What do you mean to think? Think about what? To think about me. And then he looks through her possessions for clues as to what is going on, and asks Margie for help, to which she supports her friend's privacy and right to her own autonomy. I thought your wife keeps her own secrets. Margie. In spite of being beaten by Mark, the violent fight sees Anna as the victor. While she comes to regret her behavior, she smiles in satisfaction at her angered husband, realizing she has finally achieved a level of control that she had never possessed prior. The hits are proven to be late attempts of desperation by Mark, in efforts to possess what is now seemingly lost. But the film is nuanced and emotionally complex enough to not frame female liberation as the end-all be-all. Mark responds to Anna by perpetuating the abuse that he may have also caused, but Anna is remorseful for her lies, abuse, and manipulation that she has also contributed. She fears change, just as Mark does, and wants to preserve her role in the family. Above all else, she fears Mark not liking her in the end, and losing the role of mother to Bob. The film's paradoxical construction lends itself susceptible to claims of being either a feminist or misogynist text. Either way, it spotlights both the positive and negative underpinnings of traditional relationships and gender roles, while granting darkness and dignity to its lead characters. A highlight scene in this respect is when Mark watches Heinrich's videotape and comes to understand her more. She reveals that she is with Heinrich because he says I for her, and seemingly attempts to understand her on an emotional and spiritual level, allowing for her to maintain a sense of control and security in a world where she is otherwise an abandoned possession. This desire to possess is made explicit in how she instructs a student in her dance class to bend to a point past exhaustion and pain. She rationalizes the harm she has caused as a life lesson, but she is clearly projecting her own struggles out on the poor girl. I can do as well. I can be better. I'm the best. Only in this case can she become success. Nobody taught me that. Much like the demon that possesses her body in the famous subway station scene, Anna possesses the body of this girl, by revoking any sense of agency and freedom that she was previously thought to hold. It is also a lack of agency that Mark finds comfort in, 
as he explains to Helen moments before bringing her into the bedroom. She says he views freedom as evil, but he says a lack of freedom is most extraordinary. Helen ostensibly serves as the ideal housewife, an alternative to Anna in Mark's eyes, but that does not necessarily mean that she lacks individual depth. On the contrary, the idealism underpinning Helen is marked with a level of individual agency that was hardly granted to Anna at all. Mark respects her individualism largely because he does not yet view her as his possession, which is why he apologizes for touching her upon their first meeting. What? <laughs> Sorry, it's impossible. With this in mind, perhaps the true idealized version of Anna is, in fact, one that is not possessed, and one that is to be seen and preserved through the doppelganger as a pure and innocent Helen. Now, Helen's individualism is complicated, as it relies on a balance of liberation and traditionalism. She makes it clear to Mark that she objects to arguments that women are unified by identifiable collective traits yet still falls back on female essentialism by arguing for biological exceptions. There is nothing in common among women except menstruation. Even this supposedly shared experience is to be distrusted, as not all women, not even all cisgender women, menstruate. Helen's strong opinions on women are actually informed by a fairly conservative ideology. Helen believes the power and dignity within women can be achieved by fulfilling traditional maternal roles in society which is why she is a school teacher and babysitter. Her black and white thinking is at times paradoxical, but undeniably cathartic and reassuring for Mark, as it is easier to resist change and embrace familiar pre-established binaries, which includes gender roles and morality itself. No one is good or bad, but if you want, I am bad one. I come from a place where evil seems easier to pinpoint because you can see it in the flesh. In contrast to gender essentialism, possession suggests something more complicated and fluid within its subtle subversions of recognized truths. This is the case for sexual orientation, as well as gender identity. Just as Mark may not be entirely heterosexual, he may not be entirely male either. In fact, a case can be made that Mark is indeed a woman. Heinrich even outright says so. You are not a man, Mark, you are a woman. I would not necessarily go so far as to call Mark a woman myself, as I find more value in arguing for something in between, outside of, or in opposition to, the traditional male-female binary. After all, the stability of gender, much like orientation, is something that is asked to be distrusted at various points in this film, evident by Heinrich's words, as well as when Mark calls Margie a tired boy. Tired. And then later, when he condescendingly asks Heinrich if he would like a tampon as he bleeds. Need a tampon, Which is somewhat comparable to menstruation. Is that what I do? Bleed for a while. When it pertains to family, Mark takes over both the fatherly and motherly roles for Bob, even though he seeks help from Margie and Helen to fulfill the traditionally accepted male-female quota. However, if Mark indeed struggles with gender, he is still self-loathing in multiple ways passively pursuing traditionalism, even if it leads to his downfall. If Mark isn't entirely a man, he certainly tries being one at his own expense. The third act sees a growing desire to construct a new idealistic body that both Anna and society insist upon, but once it is fully realized, Mark comes face to face with the fact that this is by no means what he wants for himself. Oh, yes. Yeah. So hard to live with it. Hey, brother. Mark previously saw this body during its formation, prior to sexual differentiation. However, Anna always recognized this creature as male, as evident by the use of traditional male pronouns, when she is visited by the detective's lover. He's very tired. He made love to me all night. Although she more or less hid this from Mark, opting instead for genderless it pronouns. It's him. This uncertainty and potentiality for gender could be promising for the ambiguously queer Mark, as he expresses undeniable fascination for both sexless 
and female bodies, a fascination hardly rooted in sexual attraction, if at all. He has similar fascination for his son's body, likely reminding him of his prepubescent past as a young boy, before his sex defined so much of his social identity. Nobody's a boy anymore. Must we prove it? His last attempt to kill off his manhood in the end is futile, as he had already come so far to build and preserve it. This is done while following the woman's lead, as he is spiritually led astray by Anna's Eve-like seduction, which suggests a secret power that women possess. After all, Anna does kill off characters who simultaneously exist as metaphorical representations of Mark's life, with the detective and his lover representing Mark's repressed sexual deviancy, and Margie possibly representing his repressed femininity. These forces threaten Anna's plan to both create and possess her idealized male lover, even if she's ultimately allowing greater social forces to possess her way of thinking. Gender identities and sexual orientations are labels adopted and assigned to individuals, often based on biological factors, behavioral traits, and or sexual preferences. In truth, they are merely performative social constructs, but ones that are used to help people navigate through their society according to their interest. And then I read that private life is a stage only I play in many parts that are smaller than me, and yet I still play them. I suffer, I believe, I am. At different points, possession inadvertently hints at the prospect of a post-gender society though it's one that will likely remain unrealized. Helen may be socially and ideologically conservative in many ways, but she also recommends moving past misogyny and gender essentialism. But I find pathetic these stories of women contaminating the universe. <laughs> I'm one of the contaminated. The collective women is a broken umbrella term. What all women have in common is also shared with men the possession of human bodies. The film entertains the existence of souls, as well as a supernatural force that may or may not be God. This leads us to spiritual identity, something that the main characters pursue or avoid in various ways. Do you believe in God? The soul is thought to be separate from the body it is symbiotically linked to, in a way the soul possesses the body, and or vice versa. Heinrich's mother notes that it would be nice to cling to the belief that the soul lives on after the body has perished. Under this mindset, Heinrich and his mother do not truly die, only their bodies do. Heinrich encourages Mark and Anna to repair and maintain their respective spiritual identities for their bodies and souls to reach perfect harmony. However, the spiritual identity that Heinrich has prided himself with is challenged after making eye contact with the creature. In truth, Heinrich's spirituality is largely a fraudulent, ego-driven simulacrum. As Anna attests, Heinrich is not the strong and unique person that he makes himself out to be. You are not different from anyone else. We are all the same, but in different words, with different bodies, different versions. Meat. Anna's newfound bloodlust is a spiritual phenomenon, an effort to protect her faith while dissociating souls from their original bodies, as a direct response to her physical miscarriage of faith in the subway station. Through the destruction of the material body, the soul is freed. Darkness is easeful. The temptation to let go promises so much comfort after the pain. That's why, through the disease, we can reach God. The bodies of Anna's victims are dismembered and refrigerated like food, but there are several other examples of material bodies being reduced to meat awaiting the slaughterhouse. A dog's corpse is seen laying under the bridge, reminding Mark of his childhood pet. Ironically, he is met with a similar fate. That dog didn't die of old age. What about you, Mark? A head can be spotted on the East Berlin streets, kicked at the wall without second thought by a man from the West. With the Berlin Wall acting as a symbolic scar, the people are spiritually dehumanized and reduced to bodies of meat. Pain persists, but is hardly felt, as the people are nullified by the social conditions. 
that tell them everything is okay. It doesn't hurt. No. When people are made helpless, it makes sense for them to seek spiritual salvation, achieved by protecting the soul. The human body is made of a tangible, meaty flesh that will eventually rot away, but the soul is beyond rational understanding, as it transcends time and pierces reality. A spiritual identity is established according to one's perceptions of God and metaphysics. While one's nation possesses a significant amount of control over one's body, one's God possesses an even greater control and a relationship with God is often built by surrendering to its force. Yet, it is also within human nature to rebel against it, to deny the extent that these greater forces dictate one's reality. Mark is at first passive, unable to effectively maintain his established spiritual and political identity, while lacking the ambition to happily construct a new one in its place. His eventual attempts at doing so fail, and the new body poses an existential threat to his soul. Evil hides behind the mask of good, Either Mark distanced himself further and further away from the truth, from God, or the film suggests spiritual identity itself is untrustworthy and oppressive. Zawowski was not a religious man, but he recognized religion's importance within culture. In a religious society, one cannot truly escape God. However, religion, like many institutions, is susceptible to corruption, which means the individual spiritual identity is too. While possession entertains spiritual relativism, it also critiques it, just as it critiques the political landscape of Germany at the time. Even if something wise can be extrapolated from Heinrich's pseudo-spiritual ramblings, he is still meant to be seen as wrong. If God is real, it is not something that can be possessed by human control or understanding. It is enormous. It wasn't even human. It was divine. Perhaps you met God a moment ago and you didn't even realize it. And if we are the ones to construct our God, then perhaps we are also the ones who use it to destroy each other and ourselves. Apparent efforts to connect the world to God, ironically enough, can lead us spiritually divorced, as human power and control are what are truly prioritized. Although spiritual identity may be intrinsically linked to the corruption by the material world, especially if God is to be seen predominantly as a destroyer, rather than giver. Notions of good and evil help individuals process information and navigate through life, but the film encourages us to think outside of this binary. This means God is neither good nor evil. God is simply God. Heinrich is right about one thing. People ought to swim to the center of the stream and pursue their spiritual interest. But if it's an individual's best interest to reject God and reject the spiritual identity in favor of humanism or something else, then that is their spiritual path in life. But it can be a harmful path. A world with God makes us into possessions of a higher spiritual power, but a world without God leaves us as possessions of our society. That is, until we crawl under the porch like a dog to die. Possession ends on a bleak note, suggesting we possess little to no control over social conditions, with both attempts to preserve and redefine political and spiritual identities being fruitless. Even the identities we construct in accordance to our society and spiritual understanding restrict the level of freedom we could otherwise possess. Indeed, identities can be quite useful for political discourse and individual liberation with the material conditions in place, but they limit our potential. A tenet of postmodern thought is rejection of essentialism. Even with established definitions of a given thing based on specific criteria, there are, or can be, things enveloped by these definitions that do not meet the specified criteria, and things not enveloped that do. The world can be defined and understood in functioning, socially acceptable categories, but these recognized essences are socially constructed. They are not foolproof. In classification, there will always be things unaccounted for. Even contemporary identity politics in the Western mainstream cling to essentialist notions when speaking on behalf of religion, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. In many ways, it can be helpful, but it can also be self-defeating. Adhering to the expected cultural identity is to conform to the oppressive mainstream hierarchy. However, counterculture identity is one established in opposition to the oppressive mainstream. And thus, reclamations of pre-established identities reinforce and internalize the exact same hierarchy. The identity exists in opposition to another, 
rather than being one that acts on its own, even if it can bring a sense of welcomed catharsis to the individual or to the collective. The postmodern answer is not to reclaim or reinforce this hierarchy through identity politics, but rather challenge or destroy it by reconstructing identities on the basis of expression rather than essentialism. Categorized identities are important in communication, but it is our best interest to keep definitions open to change and to allow for desired flexibility and conscious paradoxicality. We ought to recognize limitations of our current understanding of the world and the language and art within it, and how easy and inevitable things will change in time. Special thanks to my patrons, Pseudo Moron, Yakov Janoy, George, Greg, and Kayla. Please let me know what you thought of this video in the comments below. If you like what I do, consider subscribing and sharing my work around. If you would like to financially support me and see your name in future videos, I do have a Patreon, so check that out. Thanks for watching.